it's uh, very appropriate to introduce our next speaker whose life has been devoted to protecting American democracy and, and the stability of our country. Uh, Suzanne, you, look, you, don't, you look pretty good. Uh, uh, she was going to be here, but uh, regrettably uh, COVID grabbed her. So she's being responsible and, and not spreading. So we appreciate that, although we miss you here. Um, Suzanne Spaulding is the director of the Defending Democratic Institutions at the prestigious Center for Strategic and International Studies now, you know, exactly the subject of our meeting today. Her background qualifies her for this, and I'll just give a few of the highlights of her career, which are quite, it's quite extraordinary. She was the undersecretary uh, for the Department of Homeland Security in charge of protecting our infrastructure and cybersecurity. Infrastructure would include basically how we live, our transportation, our food, our water, everything, the whole infrastructure that we depend upon. So that was her responsibility. She had a small budget of around $3 billion and about 18,000 employees. Um, she was general counsel for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. She was six years uh, as assistant general counsel at the Central Intelligence Agency. And she was the legal advisor to the Center on Nonproliferation there. She was also the executive director of two congressional committees on weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. So I just, I don't think we could find anybody with as much qualifications to talk about, you know, the, the reality, the practical necessity of having a, a, a democracy that has institutions that protect democracy and people that take that seriously. And I just want to say one thing, which when I was, many things in Suzanne's career have been profoundly impressive to me, but when she spoke out so vociferously about the impropriety of torture as uh, with her credentials in the intelligence community and the legal community, that the illegality of it, the immorality of it and the impracticality of it and her courage and clarity on that has been consistent in the same way as her consistent career in public service. Suzanne, please. Oh, Jonathan, uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. And um, thank you to uh, for everything that you have done over so many years. Such a powerful voice you are for peace and justice in the world. And um, I'm just really grateful for our friendship over the years. And thanks for uh, including me in this really important conversation. Um, you've put me in a very tough position following that incredibly powerful statement from Congressman Raskin. Uh, really just an outstanding job he did about laying out for us exactly what's at stake here. And Mark, uh, you as well, thank you very much for what you do and what you have done. And, and, um, and again, for, for, for really grounding this conversation in, in you know, what's at stake here. And I have to say, unfortunately, that you, know, you talked about how nobody you know, sort of has really thought about what if this, this, the system does what it's supposed to do and then everybody, you know, a significant percentage of the population rejects that outcome, rejects the legitimacy of 60, over 60 court cases. Uh, and I have to say, I have to tell you that I spent, I have spent a lot of time thinking about that prior to the 2020 election. Um, uh, and I actually wrote an op-ed in the run up to the election talking about my fear that this is precisely what would happen. And I didn't push it for publication because I thought it was too apocalyptic. Uh, people would think it was and that, that I, you know, they'd see me as the person on the corner with the sign, the end is near. Um, so tragically, uh, you know, I think, I think it was, it is important for us to get our heads around those things. Jamie Raskin talked about the word coup and that we don't, we don't really conceive of that here. Um, but let me tell you why uh, I have spent so much time thinking about this and, and how important it is for us to recognize just how precarious uh, our situation is in terms of sustaining our democracy and its ability to function. <clears throat> it really flows out of my time as the Undersecretary at, D at DHS, as Jonathan described. So in 2016, I led the wonderful men and women who were working so hard to secure our election. And when I got out uh, in 2017, I did so very mindful that what we saw in terms of Russia's efforts to interfere in our election 
were really just one part of a longer term, broader campaign by Russia to undermine public trust and confidence in democracy and in our democratic institutions. And so my perspective on this starts with the research and the work I've done over the years to look at Russia's information operations uh, trying to undermine our democracy. But it's important to note, of course, that first of all, other countries, including China, but as the Congressman noted, uh, this coalition of, of, uh, of totalitarian regimes out there all have an interest in, uh, in undermining trust around the world as well as in, in, in the United States and Western countries in democracy. And of course, there are domestic voices that are amplifying these very pernicious and dangerous themes. Uh, but I was really focused on knowing that Russia had not gone away after the election. They were here, they are here every day, continuing to push this. And, uh, and so I pulled together a team and we looked at countering and made some recommendations, a bipartisan team of national security voices saying, this is a threat. These are some suggestions for how we begin to counter this threat, adversary attacks on democracy. And then I did a little red teaming. Um, as Jonathan explained, I kind of grew up in the intelligence community. And I, so I thought if I were Putin and I wanted to undermine democracy and public trust in democracy, where would I go next? What other institution like elections is so dependent on the public's acceptance of the legitimacy of the process to accept the legitimacy of the outcome? And of course, being trained as a lawyer, I immediately thought of our justice system, right? So totally dependent on the public's willingness to accept the binding nature and legitimacy of the court's decision, whether you agree with it or not. Um, as Mark said, it's almost inconceivable to us, except that we now can conceive it. What happens if that doesn't, if you can't sustain that? So I, be, so I, I hadn't heard anything about it and I thought we were getting out ahead of something. I thought that's where he would go next. As we started looking at it, of course, we realized and found evidence that, that the, our justice system has been in their targets uh, for, for quite some time. And if you look at what has happened in Central and Eastern Europe, it should come as no surprise to us, right? We've seen how Russia goes after the justice system, goes after prosecutors, goes after courageous judges who are uh, attempting to investigate and prosecute corruption behind that Russia is behind. Uh, in so many of these countries, right? They know that the justice system can stand in the way of their efforts to move the world to a post-truth reality because judges and courts are arbiters of the truth, right? As Mark described, you bring your evidence in front of the court, each side gets their day in court, they get to make their case and the judge weighs the evidence and we accept them as arbiters of the truth. Uh, if you want to move the world to a post-truth where they give up on the idea of truth of any authoritative sources of information, you go after courts, you go after the media. And Eastern European intelligence officers who followed Putin for decades have said long before any of this that that was one of his key objectives, go after courts, go after the media. He's been going after our justice system and our courts here for quite some time. And in a report that we put together and published uh, a couple of years ago, at CSIS called Beyond the Ballot, that you can find at CSIS.org, we laid out all of the evidence, and lots of this cases in which we know the Internet Research Agency, uh, Russian social media, RT, Russia Today, um, and official Russian statements from Lavrov and Putin himself um, have tried to undermine public trust in the courts. And it's important to understand the distinction here this is not a concern about criticism of the courts. As I think Mark said and others, that the, the, our system is not perfect and our justice system certainly is not perfect. What Putin does is to grab hold of legitimate grievances, right? And exacerbate those and drive home the message, this is the key, that the system is not just flawed and needing reform, but that it is irrevocably broken, that it is irredeemably broken, corrupt, chaotic, and that the individual is powerless to bring about any change. And the idea there is to get people to disengage, we lose our informed and engaged citizenry that we depend upon in democracy, or to take to the streets in violence, not to bring about change, but simply to express outrage. 
um, the, the, so the Russian military doctrine talks about tapping into the protest potential of the population. They mean violent uh, uh, protests. I think they don't understand that a healthy democracy can deal with protest, but um, because for them, protest is an existential threat. <clears throat> In any event, this is the, the, their effort at dividing us is based around building a sense of shared grievance that is stronger than a sense of shared aspirations for what our government can and should be. And so what we did when we came out with this report is we, we decided we need to raise awareness in the justice system about this threat and how to counter it. And so we started training federal judges and state and local judges, working with the Federal Judicial Center and the National Center for State Courts, talking to them about the kinds of cases that are likely to attract attention and disinformation um, uh, from, uh, from outside and the things they can and should be doing. Uh, to try to, re to sustain public trust and restore public trust. But our, but our most important recommendation was to build public resilience against the content of this pernicious messaging. So if you go back to the themes that I said they're really trying to push, and they push it through a variety of narrative frames around racism, around immigrants, uh, uh, around the, the political elite, et cetera. But the bottom line that democracy is irrevocably broken and the individual is powerless, how do you build resilience against that? And our conclusion is you teach civics. If we don't teach democracy, we can't sustain democracy. People who don't understand how our system is set up, how our system works and how the individual it, uh, can make a difference and hold it accountable are far more susceptible to that kind of pernicious messaging. And we have let civic education, civics education decline, really going back to Sputnik and the emphasis on STEM. And I am here to tell you as a cybersecurity person and national security person, I believe STEM is vital for our national security. I believe civics education is just as vital. But the federal government today spends $54 per student on STEM education. Do you know how much they spend per student on civics education? Compared to $54, five cents. Five cents on, on passing down from generation to generation the importance of our democracy and how it works. I think it's critically important that we, we instill a sense that democracy is not inevitable, it is not invincible, it is under attack, and it is worth defending not because it's perfect. It is not the promise of current perfection. It is its capability to change. It is its susceptibility to change, but only if we are educated and engaged agents of that change. And so that's how I think we begin to reconcile, frankly, 1619 and 1776, right? But if we just teach those fundamentals of democracy uh, and how it works, um, I, I really do believe that that is absolutely essential. Without that, we cannot hope to sustain our democracy. We need to be reminded of our shared aspirations for the system, a system that is fair, a system that meets the needs of all Americans, not just the elite and the powerful. We ought to be able to come together around those kinds of shared aspirations. We have to teach democracy to sustain it, and we have to teach it not just to our kids, but to our adults. We've had generations that have been, uh, been ill-served by our education system, and they are now adults. They are in every walk of life, in our government, in our military, and our law enforcement, and in our businesses. And so next week, I am launching CSIS. Uh, we are launching a Civics at Work initiative where CEOs pledge to promote, be advocates for reinvigorating civics education in this country, they pledge to have civics conversations with their own workforces, and they pledge to support civics activities in the communities where they have a presence. This is a whole of nation, urgent national security imperative. We will have Brad Smith of Microsoft, our first uh, co-signer of this pledge, Tom Fanning of Southern Company, Deborah Enix Ross, who I know you heard from and who is making civics a cornerstone of her 
uh, tenure when she becomes the ABA president, great supporter and friend, um, and a number of others who will be participating in this program. Um, I will close with uh, a, 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 a something that I have been struck by for many years that I think is important to keep in mind. Some years ago, it struck me that our national anthem that we sing starts with a question and ends with that question. It never answers that question. The question is, uh, you know, oh, say, can you see? Do you see that flag, right? We saw it at the start of the battle. We know it was there, right? At that start of that battle in uh, the War of 1812. We saw it through the night as the rockets in their red glare. But now the battle is over. The sun is starting to rise. And the question is asked again, does the flag still wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave? And I believe it is a challenge to us every day. It is up to us every day to make sure that the answer to that question is yes. Thank you.